Let's welcome from Department of Management, Carrie Johnson and Ted Nellison for the afternoon session. And remember to use the microphone, Eric Van Lanker, when you speak. <laughs> Hi everyone, how's it going? Fun day of learning all sorts of new things. I know, I know. Yeah, it says September 11th because we also talked about this two days ago, but to some different people. So um, the auditors uh, that will be looking at your budgets and documents and all that, we were doing this, a truncated version of this presentation on Monday, so it looks like we still have the same date. Um, so what we thought we would do this afternoon is, you know, again, this is sort of focused on the county auditor's role in the process because lucky uh, for all of our county auditors in the room and their staff, you have a few new things that you're going to have to do. So um, we thought this afternoon session would focus more on the county auditor's role in some of these new changes and get into a little bit more of the detail, you know, try as best we can at this point to answer questions you might have about the process, that sort of thing. And so we kind of broke it into three chunks of this new bill, right? So first chunk being this um, new public hearing notice and mailing that um, with the public hearing notice and mailing, this is going to be in relation to counties, cities, and schools, um, and then the county auditor's office has a role in that actual mailing part of it um, for those folks. So that'll be sort of our first discussion piece. Then um, we'll, I don't know if we're taking a break or kind of whatever we want to do there, we'll talk a little bit about the valuation changes that you're going to see, as well as the changes related to debt reporting and some debt um, uh, debt updates that the bill made, and then we'll end with more of a detailed discussion on the particular, on the budget limitation. So how that budget limitation will work for counties, but then also um, Ted is here, lucky him, he's going to talk about how, give some examples and talk about how that also works for cities. Now it, it is very similar as far as how that mechanism works for cities and counties, but as county auditors and staff, you know that you have to certify those county budgets and the city budgets. So um, even if you're not the one prepping the actual county budget, you're still going to have to familiarize yourself with those um, revised and different and fun looking budget forms. So what I thought we'd start out with again is that budget mailing process and the new budget notice. So there is no more max levy process for cities and counties. So up until you know last year being this fiscal 24, you had to do that max levy process, right? That additional hearing the um, notice that went along with it, you held your hearing, you had to pass a resolution, cities and counties all had to do this, right? So that piece is gone. No more max levy. Bait and but, <laughs> <laughs> but so, so you don't have to do that anymore, but instead you do, so cities, counties, and schools now have an additional hearing process that they're gonna do before the regular budget hearing process. So instead of max levy, cities, counties, and schools have this other process. And so essentially they're gonna have another hearing. I mean, that's really the action that's gonna happen is another hearing. But instead of, and, and there's gonna be a regular budget uh, you know, notice, public hearing notice of that hearing, that's published in the same manner as you know your regular hearing notices are published or posted if you're a little tiny city. Um, so there's gonna be this additional hearing and you're gonna give that regular publication notice, but there's also a mailing that goes along with it. So this mailing requires several different pieces of information and some of that information is also in the hearing notice as well. So the first sort of step we had to, to figure out is, you know, how, how is this information coming in? 
um, in order to get this mailing to happen. So cities, counties, and schools all do their budgets in our DOM system, right? So in our DOM system, they will be entering certain information into just, you know, sort of the regular budget forms that's going to be pulled into the notice. You know, that's sort of a regular process. You know, you enter information in to our system and it's pulled over into the notice that gets published, but it's also going to be pulled into our database and then available later for the mailing. So some of the information, of course, this again starts with the fiscal 25 budgets. Some of the information is gonna be entered by these locals, like time, date, and place of the hearing, right? We don't know that, they have to provide us that. Um, but some information we already know as DOM because it's already in our database, right? So current year tax rate, dollars, we have that. So no one needs to enter that data, it's in the Department of Management's database. Proposed tax year, um, proposed budget year tax rate in dollars. Obviously, the people doing the budget are gonna have to provide that information, as well as if there's an increase in what's being asked for, the reasons for the increase. And they do say detailing specific purposes or programs. So, some additional pieces of information is an example of the tax impact on a residential and commercial property. That information um, and that sort of calculation will be provided by Department of Management. Percentage of current year property tax rate in relation to other levy authorities. Again, we know current year stuff, DOM already has it, right? So we have the data, we're gonna be able to provide it out for this mailing. And then of course, time, date, and place of the hearing. So again, that notice is published in the same manner as the regular budget notice. So for counties, you know, just like your regular budget notice goes in all of your official newspapers, same thing for this, right? Um, according to 349, it has to go in all of your official newspapers. It does also have to be placed on the local government's webpage and social media. So that is sort of a callback to that max levy thing that we had, right? So similarly, it has to be out there on the webpage and social media at the same day as it goes in the newspaper. So for counties, you know, that first day that it goes in the newspaper, just make sure that it's also getting put on your website. And there's some new, this is a new sort of requirement that they put into the bill. Um, the public hearing has to be separate from any other meeting and no other business can be conducted at the hearing, right? So you can't have like a regularly scheduled meeting with all these agenda items and stick this public hearing in with um, that agenda. It has to be its own separate thing. So just keep that in mind when you've got your calendar out and you're kind of looking through, um, you know, what needs to happen when. You can't do other stuff on the night of this public hearing or day of this public hearing. At the hearing. At the hearing. You could do the hearing. At the hearing. Yeah, you could do, yeah. I mean, you could probably do, and we've discussed this, like schedule a, a meeting before and then do your public hearing, but just make sure that that agenda for this meeting with the public hearing only has it on it. So, um, and then unlike the max levy, there's no action required after the hearing itself. The purpose of this hearing is to gather input um, from your constituents, right? Have the public come and have an opportunity to weigh in on your proposed tax. And then similar to max levy, the local government can, can decrease but not increase the property tax adopted in the final budget. So um, again, you know, you can, you're gonna put out there your proposed property tax dollars to be levied and your citizens come to the hearing, they, you know, put forth their two cents on what you've proposed you can always decrease, but when you finally go on to adopt that budget, you cannot increase from what had been published. So this is just sort of an example of what um, that hearing notice will look like. Again, this will be in your budget forms. So just like you, you know, for the county folks that do the budget, you know, there's been a max levy tab. Well, you're gonna have this 
additional tab. Um, we actually can't quite decide what we're going to call it <laughs> because um, truth and taxation has kind of been the vernacular that's used, but um, you know, we might name it something a little bit more simple, simple. We haven't quite decided. But again, you'll have a tab that is for this hearing notice, and it's going to be populated by either information we are sticking in there as Department of Management, you know, all that current year information, or it's going to be pulling from information that you enter on your regular property tax page, you know, your proposed dollars, your proposed rate. So, you know, this is just sort of the top piece of it. This probably looks pretty similar. Again, county folks, you guys know that um, we always have to look at your budget in, in two different ways. We look at, you know, what are you doing in general, in your general basic, general services, and then what are you doing separately in, you know, rural services, what are those tax rates, rural tax rates, countywide tax rates. We have to present both um, pieces of that information. So, did I hear a question? Nope? Okay. So again, um, you're going to be presented, presenting this information in your newspaper, providing your countywide information and your rural information. There's going to be a comparison of um, the current year to what you're proposing. So first column is current year property tax. And um, I would point out that this is property tax and not total request. So that's gonna maybe kind of trip us up a little bit as we think about this, but this is um, property tax dollars. So again, what you're asking for for dollars and what the total rate would be countywide, what you're asking for in, in the rural services and your rural additional rate and then budget year, kind of like with the max levy, it's going to say, okay, well, if we asked for those same dollars, but we dealt with, you know, the budget year valuation, what would that do to the rate? You know, let's see a comparison there. So that is very much like the max levy. And then the third column, of course, is what you're proposing for the um, budget year. At the bottom, you're going to see this tax rate comparison. And this is, you know, again, from the bill, it's a requirement that you present the um, sort of difference or growth, change, whatever, for an urban, in, in your cases as counties, urban taxpayer and rural taxpayer needs to be presented separately. But what we're saying here is if there were a commercial or residential property with a value of $100,000 in the current year, what, what is an urban taxpayer um, paying in dollars versus what you're proposing and what's the percent change? So um, again, just an example of kind of what that looks like. Yeah, go ahead. Hello. Woo. Okay, uh, earlier today there was a question about uh, the utilities and how they would affect us. And so be based on that language, I think I'm seeing the locally assessed utilities. Utilities will be part of this, but the gas and electric, since they're not property tax, but they're excise tax, they won't be part of this. Is that right? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So this is the thing. Um, when we go through the budget and how the actual limitation is calculated, because that's a separate thing. When we talk about um, the budget limitation, that is based on requested dollars, so including gas and electric. This notice in the bill language, it says property tax, so that's why. I mean, I, I don't know if so that was on purpose. If you were asking, will this notice only show property tax dollars locally assessed and collected, yes, that's correct. What I was the notice, yes. The calculation of like your CGFL will include requested dollars. We just have to make that distinction because we're playing in both pools for different parts of the process. Right, right. two different pieces of the language. Yeah, it's, yeah, confusing, right? I mean, yep. I mean, we're, we're working through it, but yeah, this is, this particular notice per the, um, per the language of the legislation says property tax. But when we talk about the other side of it and the calculation, that includes gas and electric because it 
impacts your rate calculation. So, um, and one thing to note here, when we talk about um, a, a taxpayer that's commercial and residential with a value of $100,000, um, because of the two-tier rollback, you might remember that the first $150,000 of a commercial property is taxed like residential rollback, right? So it's essentially the value of a, you know, the taxable value, I should say, of commercial or residential, if it's under $100,000, is going to be the same because it's less than the hundred and fifty. dollars If we were looking at... Um, you know, a commercial taxpayer that's worth $500,000 and a residential taxpayer that's worth $500,000, obviously the rollback would be differently applied in those instances, but because we're in this particular example um, in the bill dealing with, you know, property that's under, that's 100000 the rollback's the same. So it's essentially, these are going to be the same, and that's why we said a commercial or residential property with a value of 100000 it's just sort of the way, you know, the example that was specified in the statute worked out. So, so that's why it's sort of grouped together. Um, again, reasons for the tax increase if the uh, proposed exceeds the current. Um, and I do have the impression from the bill that there is um, an inclination for a little bit more detail there about proposed projects um, and that sort of thing. And then also, if ap applicable, the above notice is available online, so your website or your, and or your social media, if you have that as well. So this has to be put on the website, put on your social media, and you have to keep it there. So that, again, is sort of like the max levy. Okay, so the locals go in, they do this early work on their budget, and when I say locals, of course, cities, counties, and schools. They go into their budget, they're entering in the time, date, and place of the hearing, they're entering in their proposed um, tax, and that's all being pulled and um, pulled into the Department of Management's database, right? Like, we're collecting all that data. And we're going to be providing a way for the county auditors then to be able to download that data and use that for your required mailing. So the way the bill reads is county auditors are required to mail budget statements to taxpayers by March 20. So they have to get it in there, have to get all that information typed into the system by March 15th. All that current year information um, and comparisons DOM will already have in there. So all that information is supposed to be in there by March 15th, hopefully quicker if, if people can do that. And then county auditors need to mail that out by March 20. And that's sort of a challenge. One, yeah. one, one thing I'll add on to this. I, yeah, I hear the chuckles. Right, yeah, yeah, right. we know, we know. I will be instructing my folks, so cities, and John will be instructing his folks, schools, to try to get this in there much earlier in March. The guideline I'm going to set is March 5th, right? I cannot make them do that. I am politely asking them. John will be politely asking them. So we're going to try to give you as much time as possible, but know that we're going to ask them from earlier in March, March 5th, March 10th, something like that. I'm going to go with March 5th for cities specifically. I haven't talked to John as far as what his guideline is going to be, but we cannot force them. As long as they hate the 15th, they've hit their statutory deadline. Oh, hang on, she's at the hey, microphone, um, line up. <laughs> oh, no. I've been, I've been talking welcome, to mail providers. There's a two week lead time yeah. for a big mailing this we're size. Aware. We're aware, and yeah, we've I'm made the aware. legislature aware. Um, yeah, I mean. So I, that, it, it may come into play in a cleanup. Right, process, you know, process details like that. You know, yeah, we get it. So are there um, any ramifications to cities and schools if they don't have that in by March 15th? Because we have cities that don't turn in budgets, so why would they do this? Um, and what? then, you say. right, what? shocking. And I was so, so that's Never one. That's happens. one part. And then the second part to kind of go along with that, we have to have it in the mail. Is that we have to have our file to the mail in, to the mail services by March 20th, and then two weeks after that, or five, six weeks after that because they get a whole mass of 99 counties trying to do this, 
um, then it goes out. What, do you have any guidance on that? Ted does not like my question. You're asking unanswerable questions. <laughs> um, I, the mailing one, I don't know. Uh, they, yeah, the mailing one, I mean, I think, I think we all realize that that March 20 is gonna be real difficult, right? Um, so, and, and I would say too, there's language in the bill that says uh, a taxpayer not receiving the mailing does not invalidate the mailing. So, so that makes the timeline real squiffy. So, because you could have somebody say, you could have, you know, like return mail, or you, there could be all sorts of things. Somebody does, just doesn't get it there. But that does not invalidate that it was mailed. So it, it also kind of um, it, it kind of depends on your definition of mailing, and that's something we're gonna have to parse out with the working group. Is is shipping it to the mailing service mailing it, or is it them putting in the mail mailing it? So well, that's something we'll right. have to figure out. Oh, that the code makes these broad statements, and then we have to winnow it down. Um, as far as the city question or the local gov, city, school, county, whoever, if they don't do their mailing or get it to you in a timely fashion on March fifteenth what happens to them. It does state in each of the budgetary language, so this is outside of HF uh, 718's mailing piece, it's in the budgetary language, so 384.16 for a city, it states that they can't move forward with their budget process until this is done, right? Until all of the markers for HF 718 are hit. So that includes getting you their stuff for mailing. Now, what does it say about how we clean up? Say somebody doesn't get it in to you until March 16th and you've already shipped out your, your mailing to your mailing services, what do we do then? Unclear at this point. We're still working on that. That is a question that's already been raised. We don't have a clear answer for it, we will get a clear answer for it. As far as, do you have to do, us. yeah, it, it's, we see the problem for county yeah. auditors is yeah. multiple mailings is a pain in the butt and it's a cost, right? It's a cost of time, it's a cost of money. Um, so we'll have to figure out what that process looks like. And these are all things that as we capture them, we are bringing up with the legislature um, as possible you know, friction points that might need to be taken down, okay? So there may be action on it later on, but we'll have something as we get closer. It's just we gotta parse it out. Oh, turn it on. We gotta turn it on. Hit the button. There we go. Your language on there said mail to the taxpayer, mm -hmm. but do, does that mean the taxpayer per parcel or taxpayer like per tax, what you'd send in a tax, tax statement? Right, so did everyone get that? I mean, this has been, and, and Ted alluded to our working group, there is a group of lovely individuals, some of them in the room, um, that, not so <laughs> no, come on. Um, they're all, because we are indebted to them. Um, so we have some, some of your colleagues that have agreed to sit down and we've met a few times and we're going to be meeting again as soon as we have some more things to show them out of our DOM system. Um, it, it, we've met and kind of talked through what, what does some of this mean, how do we implement it, what are some of the issues, right? Um, and, and got their feedback and, and have them help us sort of figure this all out because, you know, we're all, we're, we're all taxed with this, right? Like we're all taxed with, we are going to implement this legislation and, and how do we do that? So that's, that's what we're doing and there's some, as I mentioned, lovely individuals um, from local government and software folks as well that um, have, have met with us and, and will continue to, to talk through it. But it's sort of that question of uh, what does it mean when we talk about mailing to taxpayers? You know, obviously the code doesn't really, you know, I mean, there's, this, is a, this is a detail question, right? It's not a statutory question really, it's just they just want you to notify taxpayers is the goal of the, of the language. So then taxpayer will get an individual statement saying, okay, taxpayer, your city is meeting on this date, this is what they propose for taxes, your school's meeting on this date, this is what they propose for taxes, and um, your county is meeting on this date, this is what they propose for taxes. So it's just a way for that person, that individual taxpayer, to get it in the mail and be like, oh, okay, 
these are these dates, I could go, you know, this is what they're all proposing, I can go and I can have um, my concerns heard on, on these, uh, you know, different increases or what have you in tax. So they say taxpayer, so we have had numerous discussion um, within the working group on what exactly does that mean. Um, and this is something, you know, that is going to have to sort of be worked out with taxpayers. Is it, ex is it exact, excuse me, with your software? Um, is this exactly who is receiving a tax bill? Is it the property owner? Um, those types of questions, right? And if we're talking about an out-of-state property owner, you know, are they going to be the one that's coming um, and being present at a local hearing? You know, if, is, it, is it a lease if it's a lease owner, or what have you, are they the individual that's going to be present and interested in that local hearing? So it's going to be the, the individual that um, would receive a tax statement, but say someone has multiple parcels in a tax district, would they then get multiple statements? I think we agree that that's not helpful because it would be repetitive statements of the same information. Like those are some of that sort of detailed cleanup language um, as far as instructions go that we're gonna be working out with um, software folks and the local, local folks that are helping us. And it will be done, and I should back up a minute and give you sort of a overall explanation here. When we send that data to, to county auditors and you pull it into your system, it's gonna be like a data file that you upload into your system in the same manner that you might another data file, right? But it will be by tax district. So it'll be data by tax district that you're gonna be merging with your local information, you know, with parcels. So then all of those folks will be getting a statement that is particular to them. Like I said, their school, their, I mean, obviously county, but in their city or not, if it's a rural area. And you know, if they're a rural taxpayer, well then they would get the rural taxpayer information as opposed to the urban taxpayer information. So that's just sort of a clarification or an explanation to make. It's gonna be by tax district and it would merge with your local system data of um, those parcel pieces within a tax district um, and you know, getting those people the specific information that's applicable to them. Yeah, go ahead. Do we get to charge any of this cost back to the cities and schools, or is no. this just ours? To okay. there is no provision for that. Stay away from my cities. Um, yeah, there's no, there's no. Uh, there's no provision in the language for any sort of fee related to this. Do you know if um, that portion of the code that requires the do budget documents be submitted to supervisors in January was touched because a number of us are gonna be starting much sooner than January 20th? And um, a I have some departments that actually follow that and don't get me their stuff sooner. Oh. <laughs> So I didn't know if that was addressed in this. No, that they did not. This bill didn't make okay. any changes to that particular section of code. Okay. Excuse me. Uh, Grant Veter, Blackhawk County Auditor. Um, as far as uh, property owners with multiple properties in the same taxing district, if they have different names um, or different company names, and we can ascertain that it's the same person? Uh, can we combine those mailings? Do we have discretion in that or do we just have to send to every permutation of a person's name or company name that's in that tax district? I mean, I, I think that's really an administrative function of what you're capable of doing to meet the goal of alerting taxpayers, right? I mean- Well, how, how broadly do you want to spread that? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yes, yes, you have to, to mail to folks and definitely anyone that's unique, um, but it just doesn't address it. And so probably, I don't know how you address that when you mail tax statements, you know, like your regular tax statements. You know it for fact. 
Yeah, right. I mean, it's it's more a matter of um, you know you can document or demonstrate that you've alerted the people as re as required yeah. in the best manner that you did. It's 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 not hard and fast. Like there's some wiggle in the. They way. don't they don't define it. So, so you got to do. That's where we fall back to the language of like a mailing not being received does not constitute a violation. Right. Does not invalidate the fact that you did a mailing just because they didn't get it. Yeah. If you implemented a reasonable process. Right. There's things that that will happen where people don't get this mailing. Right. I mean, something's going to happen They're, I don't know, some something snowplow hits their mailbox and <laughs> they don't get it. I mean, something will happen that somebody's not going to get this that should have. Um, mistakes in your merge, kind of merge process would be kind of covered under that unintentional. Right, issue. right. Your, uh, you did your best administrative right. effort to, no. to comply. Yes. <laughs> don't give me ideas. Yeah. <laughs> what? Tim Jamison from Blackhawk County. Just to Grant's hey. point, we send 4,000 tax bills to one mailing address each year. It would make more sense to put each uh, notice for every tax district into one manila envelope and send it there and save, you know, 3,999 yeah. right. mailings. And, and I would say that I know that that particular question was sort of discussed amongst the working group. And it's probably going to be something that 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 group talks to the so, you know your major software vendors about is there you know could is everyone are they going to have all of their clients do it the same way or you know that's a level of detail that I mean is not not in my purview. Well, we're flesh, we're still fleshing a lot of that stuff out, but the, the general theory is efficiencies are fine, right? If if you've got all of these mailings that need to go to one address, don't send five thousand different letters. That's confusing. That does not help the taxpayer, and it doesn't help your office, right? Putting them all together in one and mailing one package is a lot less confusing, and it saves money for the taxpayer. So that's a win-win. But it would be a matter of, like, is that easier for mail services to do? I don't know what's easier for them either, and does it cost more or less? Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? Like, there's all those things, and I think that's an administrative function that, you know, will just kind of have to be meted out. But in general, we're okay with that. Yeah, I mean, right, it makes sense. We get it. As far as I say, it's okay. <laughs> reasonable person standard, just like court, reasonable person. <laughs> was, was there discussion about, you know, providing them more information than they need? So rather than doing it by tax district, list like all eight of your cities and all five of your school districts hearing information and sending the same mailing to everybody? The language is specific to taxpayer. Okay. So For they, their information. I mean, theirs, theirs would be on there. They would, I, I but they would. But <laughs> it's, that's too confused. Again, now we're skewing into, okay. it doesn't make sense for the taxpayer. It makes a lot of sense for you, but not for the taxpayer. I don't really know. I mean, at the end of the day, though, it's going to be a, you know, you're, uh, you're going to be pulling down the data and merging it with a template, and your software is going to be doing that work on the back end. So if you're mailing, you know, 4,000 of the same thing versus 4,000 slightly different things, I don't know if, if it would really make a difference. Either way, the process would be the same. But yeah, we can't send out just one. It does have to be. It does have to be 4,000 and yeah, yeah. specific to the taxpayer, so. So will there be anything on this notice that tells them that this is not the entire consolidated levies? Um, I got to look at. I don't, I don't know that there is, we can, we'll, we'll kind of walk through well, where we're at with the draft. Part, part of it, uh, I mean, part of it is language about what percent of the bill of your tax bill is represented by that each entity. entity. Yeah. So they'll get that information in a roundabout way. Even right. If we don't spell it out specifically. So no, it'll they'll, be like, they'll understand that. Part, I, well, I, it's like a tax statement. I know, I know, I know. Oh, I forgot, Barb from O'Brien County. Oh, yeah. Uh, the timeline. Yeah. If I'm getting this right, okay, let's say in a great world, we get this thing mailed out on the 20th of March. Mm -hmm. It would seem rational that we should give them 10 days from then that we have the hearing. Now, that's the first hearing, right? Yeah. And we can't 
do anything beyond that until we have that hearing to set the next, the final hearing for the budget. Is that correct? I can speak to cities, that yeah. is correct. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so 10 days from March 20, because I'm the nerd back there with my calendar, is the 30th of March, and mm -hmm. that's a weekend. So best case, you'd have it on April 1st. Mm -hmm. Now, after that separate hearing, you're gonna have another meeting to set the budget you see where I'm going, this is gonna to get tough to be done by the 30th of April, isn't April's it? April's gonna be very busy. It, which, and a lot of us don't have, yeah, yeah uh, daily, so, um, so I just wanted to make sure I was understanding that. Yep. Mm -hmm. You've got it. Okay, yep. And to her point, um, all local government budget deadlines have been extended to April 30th, so not just um, cities, counties and schools but everyone is April 30th now just so there's not confusion anymore about you know somebody being at this date and somebody being at that date and leaving you know all of the miscellaneous townships and ag extension and everybody back at March 15th everybody is now April 30th which does mean of course a little bit more of a condensed timeline for your certifications but hopefully um, some of those folks will just continue, um, you know, doing that process early. So we'll see. Yeah. Hi, Carrie. Rhonda Betts with Lynn Hi. County. Um, I just wanted to clarify, all entities, even though not all entities are have a public hearing, the first public hearing, have to have their data entered by March 15th. No. 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 Just the city, schools, and county yep. are March 15th. Okay. For their data, yep. For their data, okay. In, in order, you get the data that's needed. So their budget doesn't have to be done, but they have, they do need to enter enough data to populate that mailing, which is sort of the time, date, and place of their hearing and their proposed um, taxes and rates. Just to clarify, uh, unlike the Max Levy one, where you couldn't set the public hearing till after the Max Levy hearing, did you said earlier you could actually said your set your final hearing, that, did, that went away, right? So you can set your final hearing before you even send this mailing. Is that right? Because that addresses some of that timing concern. You mean like, so, 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 so set your first hearing date prior to this mailing going out, say, so you could meet on um, March 27th. Yeah, yeah is that, about the final is, budget. I'm talking about the final budget uh -huh. hearing. I mean, they were worried about you do this hearing and then you have to have another meeting to set the hearing for your final budget hearing. You can already have that one set. So you aren't condensing that down. A city could not, no. I, I would have to look at the, okay. the language. That, that was the way, in the Max Levy one, you couldn't yeah. set yeah. the public hearing on your final budget until yeah. you'd held that first I'd hearing. I'd have to look at the language in the okay, county so. section again. Well, and I know specifically for cities, uh, 3416, the preamble to it, states that not until all of 24 point whatever this is covered under now, I forget the exact number right. of the new, the new area, so that not until all of that is done can so that, you I, set yeah. the time. I believe it's the same for counties, but I yeah. will double check. So that check. does keep that condensed time then. It because truncates you, it, yeah. yeah. You're right. going to have a very busy April, to, to Barb's point. Yeah. So we do have an extended deadline to April 30th, and then what that also means is they, um, there's a pushback of that budget protest deadline uh, to May 10th. And so if you have folks locally that want to protest any of the budgets, again, this April 30th applies to everybody, so the May 10th applies to everyone too. Um, so folks would have until May 10th to submit a budget protest for any of the local budgets, which does make it really truncated if for us if we have a lot of budget protests um, typically you know there's a, a few a year but um, if there was a really busy year then that that would um, kind of be you know a condensed process so again um, department of management's creating the form the template your software company is going to get that template and we are collecting the data in our system and we'll be providing a method for you to download um, the needed data by tax district into your software. So the locals are entering it. Some stuff we're gonna provide. There's gonna be you know, a data file out there for you to download into your software that will then merge with the template. 
so your software folks are gonna have all sorts of fun. Um, the budget notice itself, as we have talked about it in the working group, the intent would be that it's front and back, so one sheet front and back. Um, again, data is populated by their entry, pulled from our system, and we are working with those software companies to, to make this happen. Like we've been in contact with them, they've heard from us, we've heard from them, and so we're working in conjunction to, to make this happen so it'll be available in your system for mailing. So um, the working group has put together just a draft of what this template may look like. So I've kind of showed it in pieces, but again, it's um, the intent is to have it be a one pager, but in order to fit everything on there, it would have to be front and back. So, so we've got up at the top, um, you know, this is this is the notice as required by Iowa Code 242A, you know, by taxing district. So for this taxing district, which this person who's receiving it. They have property in this tax district, right? It's telling them that you know this is a public hearing. This is a notice of public hearing for your city, county, and school as applicable. And um, it does provide um, an explanation of what the effective tax rate will be, because again, that's sort of one of those terms that sometimes people get a little bit um, confused about. And then it does say there's you know additional information on the back, right? So. So the top piece would have that populated mailing information, um, any special notes, if there were any that applied. We all know we have some of these weird one-off little tax districts that um, are sort of special cases. So, so that um, is something that the working group has talked about that may need to be addressed. Um, first of all, and I don't think the order is necessarily uh, you know, anything that's of issue, but we have the information on this example first for the Ankeny public hearing for the school, um, you know, time, date, and place of the hearing. Here's their telephone number, you know, current property tax, current tax rate, effective tax rate. Again, that's what would be the tax rate if dollars were the same and they use the budget year valuation, so that calculated tax rate. And then the proposed tax to be asked for and the proposed tax rate. And then reasons. So you would have one of those for school, one for city, if applicable, obviously, and one for county. Did you want to ask a question, Grant? Go ahead. Yeah, I do. Um, so we're going to have to, at some point, comb through this bill to find some of the specific information instead of calling you for all of our answers. And I'm just curious if you have an idea when the code will be updated because it's a lot easier to read the code section than to oh. read the bill. I guess usually January, right? Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm maybe I January. I'm not exactly I sure. I believe January is when it statutorily has to be done. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. And so one of the requirements or informational pieces that has to be included in the mailing is showing the taxpayer how current taxes within their tax district, you know, where they live, is distributed. So, you know, them looking at the tax that's with, within their tax district and the, those that are taxing, how does that fall? Like, it's the school getting 50% and the city's getting 25%, like how, how does that sort of met out in their particular tax district? So again, this is something we'll calculate and provide um, you know, based on the current year information, and it just so shows like, hey, you know, Ankeny Schools is 45% of the tax, Polk County in this particular tax district is 17, City of Ankeny 26, and then everybody else is 11%. So that kind of goes to that question of people understanding like who's getting the majority of the tax where I live. So that's that informational piece. And again, that'll be provided for you. And then we have the um, example, again, of taxes on a property with a taxable value of $100,000 and how that would be shown in both the current and proposed budget years. So this is basically the same thing as what's on the notice, except it's going to list 
um, you know, all of the applicable levy authorities for that individual taxpayer. Uh, whereas, you know, the notice obviously is just for that school or that city or county. This, the taxpayer is being told, okay, for my city county school, you know, this is what a $100,000 um, valued taxpayer, you know, would see as far as current year versus proposed tax rate. And again, shows the difference, which in this case, you know, we're not showing any difference or we're showing it going down, which, I mean, it could do anything, right? Could go up, could go down. It's just a comparison. Um, the data itself, and this is really probably a little bit behind the scenes, um, but the data itself will be in a data file that your software is gonna load up for you. You know, there'll be a process for you to go to our website and when it's ready, we'll be able to, you know, give you that tutorial about, okay, you know, you go to this page, you click your county, you do this, um, you know, download of this data and that's how it works. Um, but it's gonna be very detailed, as I mentioned, by tax district and it should be all the information that's required um, to populate the template and the mailing for all those different um, taxpayers. So that is an overview of the mailing piece of it. So before we go on to anything else, I just kind of want to see if there's other questions that folks have about the mailing side. Okay. I'm not really sure what time. Do you have the agenda? I don't really know what time things are supposed to end. Different pieces. Lucy Martin, Story County Auditor. Um, yeah. My question is, uh, you know, we don't have any authority over these other um, political subdivisions that are providing this information. Mm -hmm. And the House file says, a levy shall not be valid unless and until such notices are published, mailed, and filed. So if a taxi authority, for instance, I had a city that they met to pass their budget and the council refused to take take any action. Mm -hmm. You know, the clerk was kind of beside herself, but, and right. eventually got them there, but. Right, I mean, you're not responsible for holding their hand and getting them there. Right, so, but um, it says the levies are void. So if a city doesn't give us information and it goes out with nothing in there, does that mean, is it like when Zeering didn't file their budget and they had no taxes for a year? Because I've done that and that's super fun too. Right, right, exactly. So. No, I mean, that's what Ted alluded to. I, the bill doesn't address the consequence. Well, it does. Well, not, I mean, it does, it but it doesn't give them an out, right? It doesn't right. give like a, de like, oh, you know, request an extension. It, it doesn't. Oh, back to the mic. Oh, right. sorry. You're I trailing mean, off. Sorry, sorry. I was moving away from the mic. Um, <laughs> it does it. I'm floating away. <laughs> Float right out the door. No, just kidding. Um, right. It doesn't address the what if. And we know the what if happens. It happens every year, right? right. Well, I that, mean, it's going to happen. That's why it's called levies void, I think. So. Yeah. Well, it's, it's the, the problem here is the bill is not specific enough in that regard. Right. It gives you what could happen it gives you room to correct it by being silent on the fact that it says a mailing. It does not say like the only mailing. So does that put the onus on you to do the mailing at their insistence if they come in after March 15th? These are things we haven't figured out yet and questions that we're I posing. That I can't charge them for according to the other that's, earlier answer, yeah. That's a fair question. Yeah. And that's, these are questions we're still posing to the drafters and the, the brains behind the bill because I don't like think what's the intent. Well, I mean, the real the, the one know. intent that I can pin down is they are not looking to zero people out. That was never the intent was to just and, and zeroing is a good example of this, because let's say zeroing zeroed this year, 24. Mm -hmm. Right. Their base when we start calculating would be zero. So they'd never right. get off of zero. And they'd that's be at not zero until FY 29. That's not the intent. Right. That's a, one of those unintended consequences or oh, just there's things lots of those in here. Yeah. Well, <laughs> well <laughs> And we're trying I mean, to catalog you know. every single one of them. But, so. but no, I mean, that is something that actually has already been brought to the attention of, of folks legislatively. Yeah. yeah and, the, and we're the, working you know, with them the, on that. Something could happen. You could end up, you know, I mean, this, they don't know in the practical application of things what can happen. I mean, you know, if you look at things from a statutory perspective, it's just like, doesn't everything just fall 
exactly how it's supposed to go, well, we're dealing with people, right? So, I mean, let's be honest, people are gonna make mistakes or, you know, how, how do we deal with those circumstances? I mean, that's, it just, you know, something people don't take into consideration. And we're still working on that angle. And the one thing that I've pinned down that I've gotten definitive confirmation on, <coughs> their intention is not to zero people out wholesale. So I don't think that's intended to be a end all be all zero. If you miss the 15th, you're at zero, period. But if you read the bill, you could definitely get there reading the bill to say, if you miss this deadline, you're just done. Yeah, I mean, they have a section called levies void. So I think there they, is intent there. They do, do, but, but the, the, the brains behind the bill, that was not what they said their intention is. So right. there's no Thank brains you. behind this bill. <laughs> um, that's a comment for Lucas, not us. Remember, we're in this boat together. <laughs> um, and, and then I, I would say, I had a thought. I mean, the, the current statute does allow for an extension, right? So I think, yeah. I think we know currently in law, there's, there's meant to be sort of a little bit of a give, you know, for, for those deadlines yeah. in general. Like, we know that that's you know, however long ago when they put in those um, opportunities for extension that they're, they weren't trying to, you know, death knell to, you know, local, those local governments that had something happen and couldn't get their budget done. So, um, so I think there is, you know, we know that there's that side of it too, but how does it exactly apply in this particular situations where we know people are people and things are going to happen and mistakes are going to happen and what do we do? Um, yeah, I mean, that's continued discussion we'll on that. And we'll provide it to you when we get there. Right. Are there any other questions about the, uh, like this piece of it, the mailing piece? Yeah, actually, we did talk about that. So um, when we're talking about the uh, presenting the information as far as, you know, how much of the tax asking is school versus city versus county versus all others, um, he was asking about should it be ascending, so like smallest to largest, largest to smallest, whatever. Um, and yeah, actually, I think that is that was a discussion item within the working group, like how to present that. Right, the other, the other thing, and the thing that we're tying to right now, the other option is, so on the front side of that form, you've got school listed and all of their info, you've got county listed and all of their info, and then you've got city listed and all of their info. So why would you not present the percentages in the exact same order, yeah, so that nobody I mean, gets confused front to back, who is which? So that's the way it's lined up currently, not to say it'll stay that way, because there's a valid argument for highest to lowest, but if, if it's on the same statement, you probably want it to read the same way. You know, front's ordered so, back should be ordered so. Right. And that's kind of the logic. Yeah, right. and I mean, I don't think, um, you know, that's, that's something, you know, from the working group, we'll just kind of see, we can all get on the same page, and that'll be what the template is, so. All right, so if there's no more questions about that piece of it, yes, go ahead, come to the mic. Sorry, I was instructed. <laughs> Tell people to come to the mic. Yeah, we stole that mic. Yeah, so sorry, you gotta so walk further. Use it. Yeah. A little bit about the notice. As it says in the second sentence after the meeting time, date, oh goodness. So the wording on the public notice says, after adoption of the proposed tax levy, the board will publish notice and hold a hearing on the proposed county budget. So do they have to take action at that first public hearing? No, that's probably just old language from the max levy. Okay, so, so we can ignore that. Yeah. Okay. Thank yeah, there's the one thing we can say for certain out of that first hearing, there's no resolution required. Right. Okay. No it's only a hearing. Time. It's a hearing to gather information to help you make your decision. So, yep. We'll make sure that that's, yeah. Everything is still in draft. And at this point, our um, 
our software folks have you know all these drafts and are trying to plug them into our online system so there'll be a lot of tweaking as we move forward with how those exactly look and how they're presented so um so the, what's that uh, oh yeah do you guys want to take like a five minute break yes no thank you for clarifying that for right us. right <laughs> half grumbling each way it's helpful okay so we won't um, but if you need to leave at any point you're welcome to and this is you know kind of maybe a little bit more straightforward section I don't know you want to do value? yeah okay. let's do valuation so if you don't have to do if you don't do valuation in your county then probably have less um, interest in this topic and then we're also going to talk about the debt piece of it those debt changes Ted's going to talk about that so just because I'm I'm ready to sit down. <laughs> okay. I'm sick of sitting down. Yeah, because he's going to stand anyway, so he might as well just stand over here. Um, so there, there was changes made to, um, to different things that affect your valuation process. So some of those are in effect for assessment year 2023. So that would be, you know, those values that you guys are going to be submitting to Department of Management this December. Um, and some of those are a little bit further down the road, so we'll talk about those. And then we'll also talk about uh, some reporting, some changes to, de to debt, some reporting changes to debt, um, and all that sort of good stuff that's coming along with it. So the first thing to talk about is Division 5, and this was related to the Homestead Credit and Exemption. So this did go into place with assessment year 2023. Um, so what it is, is okay, homestead credit, still there, still what it was, right? But then they added a homestead exemption. And that's for individuals 65 and over. So that is an addition to the existing homestead credit. Again, starts with this, um, this assessment year, so for the fiscal 25 budgets, um, the exemption is 32.50 for assessment year 23, and then for assessment year 24 and moving on, it's an exemption of 6,500 in value. So keep in mind when we say exemption, we're lopping that value off, right? This isn't a credit against levied taxes on the back end. This is lopping that value off just like your military exemption. So, you know, taking that value right off of it. Um, there are some form changes that were made. I know this is more sort of, um, you know, on the assessor side of, of life, but the homestead credit form has to allow the ability to claim the exemption. Um, and I know it, it, there was some, some challenges with that because it went into effect so quickly and the um, homestead uh, deadline was so quick that they were trying to figure out how to you know get those folks that, that can receive it in assessment year 23 how you know to make sure that those folks that can qualify to get it actually do get it so I mean we're kind of past that deadline now but I know that was um, one of the challenges so so that's you know again homestead credit same as always exemption is new over 65 lopping the value off of um, lopping the, the value off of, of being taxed. The current homestead credit is continued to be state funded, um, but there isn't state reimbursement for this exemption that was created. So homestead credit sort of treated same as always, but this exemption piece for those over 65 um, is new um, and it's not, uh, you know, not uh, backfilled or however you want to say it from the state. So military exemption, um, for the most part, stayed the same except for the amount. And this is, again, assessment year 23. The amount of the military exemption uh, was increased to 4,000. Again, you know, that's an exemption, so slicing that value off. Um, the current military exemption has been for a long time, 1852. So it's now 4,000. And um, it will no longer be funded moving forward. So beginning with the fiscal year 25, because that would be tied to our assessment year 23, 
um, it's no longer going to be you know, a, f a funded item that you receive as a state appropriation. So there's those two changes. Uh, military process-wise, not really anything. It's just increased and um, it's no longer backfilled by the state. Um, homestead, we add that exemption piece. So we gotta deal with that exemption piece in our valuation process because it's a reduction of value. So I'll kind of get to that in just a minute about what that will look like for you guys. And it's not, it's not a serious change, but it will be a software change, et cetera, et cetera. So um, Division 7 is urban revitalization. And this made a couple changes. One, you probably won't really need to deal with. Um, it does require a minimum assessment agreement on any new commercial abatement agreements. So if someone wants to put in play a city or um, a county wants to put in place um, urban revitalization, if it's for commercial, there needs to be a minimum assessment agreement with those property owners. So if you're, an, if you're a county that wants to do those kind of programs, that's something to be aware of. And it's um, not only new agreements, but it's also if you have um, this sort of program in place, it's for those new applications to existing agreements. Um, this is the one that you're gonna have to deal with on the valuation side, and it's for urban revitalization that includes residential value. Um, there's always been this concern that, okay, you know, like say a city will put in place an urban revitalization area, they're offering, um, you know, abatement on all sorts of new housing, people are gonna come there, but because the value is abated, those schools aren't really getting, um, you know, the benefit of those tax dollars for those additional students, right? That's sort of always been the concern. Um, and it's been talked about for a number of years, like this, this is something that, um, you know, legislatively they've, they've wanted to address or talk about, et cetera. So what this bill did then is say for urban revitalization that includes residential, so a city or county that would put in place that type of program, the school rate, the total school rate can still apply to that abated residential value. So say um, you had an abatement program that provided 50% abatement on residential properties, you know, in a given year. 50% of that, of course, would just be paying the regular consolidated rate. 50, the other 50% of that, instead of it being paying no rate, no dollars, would be paying the school rate, which could be, you know, as, as you know, maybe 40 to maybe 50% of the overall consolidated rate. So that's just something to be aware of. It's, it's good to be aware of it if you're a county that has these types of urban revitalization programs. Um, and cities, obviously, that have these type of programs are going to have to look closely at them and make sure that they put in place those changes. For value, what we're going to have to do is make some changes to sort of separate out these, um, these parcels into tax districts where we can apply just the school rate, right? Because the school gets to tax against that value, and we gotta make sure that they can do that, so we're gonna have to create a new type of tax district. <laughs> so, so lucky you guys. Um, it's not effective right away. You will see um, sort of the option in the software because we, um, we got a little bit of um, funding to make these changes, so we're trying to make all the changes now, even though it won't be active yet. So keep it in the back of your mind when you see this schools only or anything like that, just be like, oh, okay, that's coming. But you don't have to deal with it right away. It's effective for assessment year 25. So that'll be fiscal year 27. So at that point, you may see some of that coming through. Well, and the important date to keep in your mind here is uh, <laughs> July 1, 2024. So any agreements, any new residential abatement agreements even if it's in an existing area or if it's in a new area, if the agreement date is after July 1, 2024, it's schools only. If it's prior to that, schools only does not apply. Okay, so July 1, 2024 is that cutoff point. Right, it's not intended to be a situation where somebody's, you know, it's, they're in the middle of a 10 year abatement and all of a sudden they have to pay the school rate. That's, that's not what they're trying to do. They're trying to make sure that they're not impacting anyone that's you know, you know, any current 
in place running, you know, agreements. So, so yeah. So keep it in your mind. Again, if you are a county that, you know, is does some urban revitalization programs, definitely take a look at that language so you know um, what changes you have to make moving forward. On the valuation side, just be aware that um, you'll see some changes in our system. They won't necessarily be used right away as it relates to this, but um, we are planning ahead for that. So at this point, um, what I could do, you know, actually before, yeah, I'll, I'm gonna do the rest of the valuation stuff and then I'll give it back to Ted for the debt piece. So Division 9 of the bill um, talks about county auditor valuation reporting. Um, there's always been a, a question about, um, you know, say when you as a county or a city sees valuation increase from a year to a year, you know, is that increase due to just simply the revaluation of existing properties? I mean, obviously there's gonna be some increase due to that, or is, um, is part of it or some of it or majority of it or what due to actual new, new value, new construction. So there's always been sort of an interest in that data. Well, we know that when assessors report on their abstract, they do define or sort of split out that data, right? Whether it's, um, what's it called, revalue or other additions, I believe, something of that nature. So, but we don't at DOM, like we've never made that distinction because for taxes it doesn't make a difference, right? I mean, whether you're, whatever your value is, you're gonna be applied the same tax rate. Um, but again, there's an interest in that data, so th what the bill does is require county auditors to submit um, this breakdown of data beginning with the assessment year 2024. So not what you submit you know, this December, but for the next year, that's when it's required in, um, in the bill. So we are um, working with software companies to sort of, you know, let folks know that. There's different, different ways that this could be approached. It could be just, you know, a separate, separate upload um, or a, an appending of data to what you already do. I, I mean, we've talked about some different options there. Again, it would be all of your value data, but splitting it um, between what's new construction and what's other additions. At this point, there's not, um, they haven't specified that they're using this data for, you know, X thing, but we know that um, they are interested in this data for, you know, future decision making for tax purposes. So, again, we're working with your software companies. Um, that'll be sort of a, a process that's, that's worked out as we go forward, um, but it would be for assessment year 2024. Yeah. Why is this information coming from the auditors and not from the assessors? Because it would have to be by tax district. When they report on their abstract, it's not reported in the way that would be usable for DOM purposes. It would all, it would all, go ahead. I'm terrible, I'm just as bad as you guys. Uh, it also has to be taxable and assessed, right? And the assessor generally just deals with assessed value. Right. Well, we aren't gonna know if it's new or not. You're, but there's, gonna, there's gonna have to be a bridge built right. in the system right. to allow you that information. Right, so the assessor knows, but when you get it, it doesn't, it doesn't matter anymore, so you don't know. But what we're gonna have to see happen is that information of new versus not carried through. Okay. From it's it'll be like a communication piece with the data flow. Yeah, because the information exists. It's right. not that it doesn't exist. It just doesn't usually channel. So we got to build a channel for it. Right. Because keep in mind too, there's TIF. There's all sorts of things that you guys do to that data before you give it to us, in order for it to be taxed. To, you know, rollback, TIF, all that good yeah. stuff. So. Um, so for uh, those changes that I mentioned, um, the new uh, homestead exemption, and then that schools only piece. So the schools only piece will be a flag that is um, you know, on a tax district to kind of uh, define it, separate it out as a unique type of tax district. And then the um, taxable homestead and taxable exempt. This is just an example of kind of the data that you guys upload to us. 
So we're going to have these new pieces of information, and it will be right, um, you know, appended sort of on the end of the data file, which you might not ever, like, really look at this data file, and that's fine. It's just an example showing you that, you know, when the data comes from your software system, it's going to include these pieces of information. So for schools only, if you went in um, and created a new tax district, if, if you've done this in any sort of recent time, you would know, you go in and you say what type it is, city ag, city exempt, and now there'll be a schools only flag option. And then when you go on for this tax district, again, the only people that can tax against this value is schools, so when you, stick the levy authority along with this tax district, it's just going to show you your schools and then you populate, you know, assign whichever school's taxing against that value to that tax district. So um, and in that case, as far as actually creating the tax district in our system, it should be pretty straightforward. Um, for our homestead exemption, this just shows you, you know, from the screen, if you were to look at a tax district, in our system, you know that it shows you know all the value by class, both 100% and taxable in two columns, and in the current system. So if we're talking about you know the um, assessment year 22, you would just see the military exemption, both assessed and taxable. Well, when we move into 23, there's also going to be a homestead exemption, both assessed and taxable, and those again come off. Um, that gross value in order to get to a net taxable. So that's just showing you what it'll look like in the system. Again, this is gonna be populated into your software, um, but these things will look differently because of this um, change in the law. Yeah. Are there any other valuation changes that you guys wanna talk about? Questions. Yeah, changes, questions that you guys wanna talk about? If not, I will turn it over to Ted to talk about the debt changes. Okay. How about it? Okay. So, debt issuance. I know most of you probably don't care, as counties hardly ever issue debt. Um, but it will be, there will be some changes. Um, some of these are actually good changes uh, that you may enjoy, believe it or not. Um, the, the main change, though, is, is going to be one that will be a big change for, for your locals. And this is more of an elections issue than it is a debt issue. Uh, so general corporate purpose debt, not essential corporate purpose debt, but general corporate purpose debt generally has to be voted on unless you can fit under the preset thresholds by, by population and by uh, cost of project or, or amount of issuance is probably the better way to look at it. Used to be uh, you could hold those votes at various points in the year. There were like three regular points, and then you could glom on to special elections. If like the, the school was having a special election, a lot of time you could get onto that and hold your debt issuance vote. Those provisions have been removed, and now the only date when debt, new debt after July 1 of 2023, that has to go to a vote. The only time that that can um, go to a vote is in the regular November election. Okay, so you've got just the November election, and that's it, okay? So that'll be a big change, uh, and it's for debts that have been, the process has started on the debt after July 1 of 2023. So you're still gonna have a couple that have already previously started, they've held some hearings and stuff, and the vote is still allowed to be outside of that, but now any new debts that start right now and forward, they're gonna only be voted on in November. That's the only time uh, that you can hold a vote. And again, this, this basically is just general corporate purpose debt. If you've got an essential corporate purpose debt, that's still not subject to vote. So you can still, uh, that one still moves through as normal. The, th the change that affects both of these types of debt, both general corporate purpose and essential corporate purpose is the statement on property tax impacts that have to be part of the published notice, the published, published issuance notice. There has to be now a statement, you can see the, the verbatim quote at the bottom, an estimate of annual increase in property taxes that'll result is a, a uh, that will result from this bond issuance on residential property, and again with an actual value assessed, read actual as assessed value of 100,000. So if 
you're doing a debt issuance, whether it's general or a central corporate purpose, you have to put in a statement in your published notice of, of hearing on it that states here's going to be the effect on a residential taxpayer at a value of $100,000, up, down, indifferent. Yeah, Grant. Are you supposed to base that on the, the current year taxes, or are you supposed to make an estimate for the next year? Uh, it would be current year, ta you'd use the number you have, so current year taxes. Yeah, that's a good question, because if you're going to have a crossover, uh, you know, into the next July, what would it be? But you would have to use current, because that's all we've got. Yeah, I don't think they want to get you into the realm of estimating, because then you could always estimate, oh, it's going to have zero impact. <laughs> None. <laughs> We're perfect. We're going to balance it out exactly. So yeah, you'd have to use it on current, but that's a good question, because it doesn't really address it. What's that? Actual, yeah, read actual as assessed, so assessed value of 100000 so, but you, you would apply the rollback to 100000 to get it down to 56000 or 54000 now, and then apply that to your taxes. So yes, apply the rollback when you do the rate, because you have to apply the rollback when you do the rate. But yeah, that's a valid question, because it just says actual value. But then you just implement your normal tax process. Roll it back, apply the rate, figure out what it's going to be, and then compare that to current rate and see what it does. Okay, that's what they're looking for, is how much up or down will happen for this taxpayer. And this is going to be in terms of dollars, actual dollars out of pocket, right? Not rate change, because rate change means nothing to most taxpayers. So put it in terms of here's how much your tax bill will be increased, decreased, or not changed. Okay? Pretty straightforward. Let's go, I'm going to talk first about the other piece of this that's, that's a little less straightforward. Um, so in addition to, you know, uh, the, the changes to voting and the changes to the statements that you have to be made, they also changed the thresholds for um, general corporate purpose debt issuance when you have to have a hearing and when you don't, and this is the good change for you. They actually increased the, uh, the caps at when you have to not, or when you cannot have a vote. So those, those dollar amounts went up, the, va the population amount stayed the same, but the dollars under which if, you're, if you fall under which you don't have to have a vote on a general corporate purpose, those limits were raised. So you can actually issue now more general corp corporate purpose debt without having a vote than you could before. The other piece of that, though, is uh, DOM was tasked with, starting in January of 2025, will adjust those limits every year based on CPI. So every single January, starting January 25th, you're going to want to come out to our website and grab the new adjusted figures for what are those thresholds after we apply the CPI change. So CPI has been going up, so that will drive limits up as well. If CPI goes down, limits will go down. Okay. Th this, this is for general corporate, just general, because essential you don't vote on. So essentials are non-vote. The d generals are the only ones that have the limit layers at least for cities. Counties, I'm sorry, that's different nonsense. But for, for cities, it's only the generals that get voted on. Um, and is it the same for counties? Same for counties. There you go. So watch that. The important part here is remember, if you're going into a debt issuance after July, January 1 of 2025, you've got to come to our website and grab the newest figures for your, for your thresholds, okay? And that'll change every January thereafter. So the first one we'll do is January 2025 and then everyone thereafter. Okay, right below that it says we have a report that we also have to do to the General Assembly on local government debt, in this case city and county debt, because you, you guys are the only ones who got hit with this. Um, but we have to do a report on bond issuance uh, by December 1 of each year. And in order to do that, whoops, in order to do that, we're gonna have changes to the annual financial report. These changes were in the bill anyway, but we would need them to do the report. So it kind of works hand in glove. Uh, on your AFR and on city AFRs, we will be expanding the debt reporting. Right now, debt reporting is categorized by project type and, and pay, repayment source, and it's kind of grouped. And, and just for cities. Yeah, and that's just for cities. Counties don't even, that's right, counties yeah. don't even do debt reporting. But for cities, they group them and do an aggregate, right? So you guys don't do it at all, so this will be a new piece to you. But it won't really be that new because it'll be like your long-term debt page in your budget. So you're going to have to itemize all of your debts every year on the AFR, and we're going to have to include the information up here. So it's basically going to be project type, name of the project, year of issuance, the, the amount issued. The, we're going to include um, 
the one thing we're going to include that wasn't in the bill, but it makes sense and it'll match up with your audits, that's why we're doing it, is the range of, of um, interest rate. So lowest, highest, that matches up with how you're audited anyway. Uh, so we're just, just bringing those two reports in line. Uh, the big piece here that has never been on anything else, uh, any other kind of reporting, the big change here is, was it voted on? Did it have to go to a, did it have to go to a council only vote or did it have to go to a, a vote of the citizens? You have to outline that for every single, um, every single debt. And then again, if it's general corporate purpose, was it under the threshold and that's why it wasn't voted on or did it have to be voted on because it, it went out over the threshold? Um, otherwise, I'll, the rest of this information is just gonna basically be carryover from your long-term debt page of that same year. It'll be itemized debt by debt uh, and a lot of the same information. So that's the big pieces of the change of debt issuance. Again, the biggest piece of that is the change to elections. Once it's just November now, there's no uh, getting around and using other special dates for, for those elections on general corporate purpose debt. Um, so just bear that in mind when you're planning. Obviously, uh, if you're using debt, you're probably gonna be using a bond council, they're well aware. They'll help you structure your calendar accordingly. Um, but just know that it's, you gotta have a lot more lead time on your debt issuances, uh, or you have to adjust your calendar in accordance with the, the election periods now. Any questions on debt? See, I knew you guys wouldn't care. Counties never have to issue debt. You guys have all the money. <laughs> Go ahead. I have a question I really don't wanna ask in front of everyone. I mean, well, then you could just, you can come see us after. No, it's okay. We'll have, we'll have a, a Catholic church style confessional set up. We okay. won't even look at you. More fuel for everybody to make fun of me That's in the future years. Um, we, have, we have our general obligation bond. Uh -huh. We already have that debt. We want to increase it by $400,000 to redo our tuck pointing. Does, does that have to be done at election time to in November also? Or can that just be done with hearings? Carrie, that's a threshold question, I would imagine. That wouldn't be dependent on your threshold, so your population and then your amount. So you'd have to go through the code and check your threshold. We're just a tiny over 10,000. Oh, you're just 10,000 over your threshold? No, 10,000 oh, okay. population. Oh, just 10,000 in population. Well, I don't know the thresholds for counties oh, okay. off the top of my head. I don't know them off the top. Yeah, I would say check out your thresholds um, I don't know code section in 331 that it is, but we can get that to you. Just okay. submit that question to Carrie, okay. and we'll get, because we have to look at the threshold calendar. I don't have them memorized. I probably should, but I don't. Okay. Um, so, Do you know, Lucas? Oh. No, he's got a, another question, but we'll what? submit that in an email to Carrie, and we'll get you the answer. Ted, uh, Lucas Binken with the Iowa State Association of Counties. And uh, that's good, and you can go. <laughs> hey, thanks for having me. Uh, so, Long time listener, first time caller. I, I actually had a, an example this morning. So under 25,000, I believe, Carrie, is all the same. So under 25 went from 400 to 520 with the 30%. There so you go. Tuck pointing should be good. Uh, mm. Good planning there to pretty, pretty close numbers, I guess is my point. But yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. Th the great majority of counties are, or not great majority, but you know what I mean, under 25,000. Yeah, um, yeah, most of them are. Yeah. And those numbers were updated uh, in code, and then moving forward, you indicated it'll just be Don. It says we have to put out a release is yeah. the way that it's so. worded. So we won't be changing the code. It'll just be the way, that we're, the way that we're looking at doing it, and this is not finalized in any way, but the way we're looking at doing it right now is we'll issue it on our website in some place of prominence as a PDF saying here's the new limits, yeah. right? And we'll um, send that, like that'll be a news item on our website. So sign up to our RSS feed on our website so the, the new news items, the new releases, you get a notification in your inbox because we have that capability on our website. And you'll get, if you go to our website, you'll have a pop-up that'll ask you to do that anyway. Um, you but stick that, you know, in the ISAC magazine. And we'll send out, sort of we will send out an email as well like we do with everything else when we have important news. We have our mailing list. Carrie has a county auditor's mailing list. I have a city clerk emailing list. And we'll send it out to our, our listservs too, saying, hey, this has been updated. You can find it here. Here's a link, right? And that's a PDF. We'll probably just attach the PDF because it'll be a one-pager. So it's not like it's going to be too big for an attachment. 
Um, so that'll be the methodology in which we get it out. It will not, but that's a great question because it will not be updated in code. It just has to be a release from us in every future year. That's why I'm saying hit up our website. Any other questions on the debt pieces? Because if not now, we will take a break, I'm assuming, Amanda. Yes, so we'll take a break. There's some snacks right out here, so about 10 minutes or so, and come back in and we'll finish up. Ooh, snacks. Good? <laughs> 